Uh, an amazing woman, practitioner, a thought leader, Dr. Kelly Brogan. Welcome, Kelly. Great to be here, Mark. I'm really glad you're here. Yeah, thanks so much. Let me, let me take a minute or two and brag about you for our viewers and listeners. <laughs> so Dr. Kelly Brogan is board certified in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, reproductive psychiatry, and integrative holistic medicine. She practices functional medicine, which is a root cause approach to illness as a manifestation of multiple interrelated systems. Now, after studying cognitive neuroscience at MIT and receiving her MD from Cornell, uh, Dr. Brogan completed her residency and fellowship at Bellevue and New York University. I used to live right there, by the way. Um, she's one of the nation's only physicians with perinatal psychiatric training who takes a holistic evidence-based approach in the care of patients with a focus on environmental medicine and nutrition. She's also a mom of two and an active supporter of women's birth experience. And she's the medical director for Fearless Parent and an advisory board member for GreenMedInfo.com, Fit Pregnancy, Pathways to Family Wellness, and lots more. She practices in New York City and lectures all over. And it, it, it's, Dr. Brogan, it, it just seems like you kind of burst onto the scenes and have really been holding an important voice in, I think, in a lot of places in health and wellness and mental health and physical health. Can you just give us a sense of how you got on your journey as a doctor, a psychiatrist, a healer? What, what prompted you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, first of all, that's very flattering to hear. I'm not sure my impact has been quite that widespread, but I do have a big mouth and I'm trying to spread the word <laughs> about a couple of things. Um, I, you know, I have a very sort of defiant personality to my parents' chagrin and have always been somebody who felt that I had to, you know, pave my own path. Um, but I have been very interested in, in brain health and in, you know, behavioral medicine since college, since I worked on a hotline, a suicide hotline at MIT. And apparently that's a quite a relevant role to play at that, at that <laughs> college. So unfortunately, um, so in studying psychiatry, I really felt like I had relinquished my interest in, in women's health in, in sort of, I don't know, all of the, the wonderful things uh, around caring for women that I think come very natively to me. Um, but there's a specialty in psychiatry called reproductive psychiatry, as you mentioned in my bio, and it's sort of a burgeoning specialty. There's about three or 400 specialists around the world. And the nature of the specialty is to explore the literature and try to help patients around informed consent. Uh, so if they are to take a medication during pregnancy or breastfeeding, what does the you know, eminent literature support. And I spent a number of years medicating women with all sorts of medications uh, after they would consent, given my, you know, sort of in, given the information I had to share with them. Um, and it wasn't until my own pregnancy during my fellowship uh, that I began to sort of look beneath the hood a bit. I uh, began to research obstetrics and sort of what my OB at the time was telling me about you know, what my options were, you know, around ultrasound frequency, around birthing um, parameters in the hospital. And I started to really, you know, it's like looking behind the curtain at Oz when you realize that it's, it's a house of cards that pharma built, uh, you know, that, that we as doctors are, are really inhabiting. Uh, and once I started to, you know, investigate that in obstetrics, then I finally shown the light on psychiatry with the help of a, a very important book uh, by a journalist named Robert Whitaker called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Um, I remember reading it in 2010 and just crying because it was so disabling to me. You know, I could barely mm -hmm. meet with a patient again and, and, and pick up my prescription pad, which had been my only tool before then. Um, and so it really inspired a, an activism in me. So I, you know, I, I, I care for patients. I come to my office every day. I love my job, but I also have a, a burning <laughs> core, you know, that, that things need to change and that transparency and patient empowerment and grassroots activism are the answer to that. So that's really what, it, you know, what I wake up thinking about and, and go to sleep ruminating about every day. All right. Good for you. So, so Kelly, in your years of practicing psychiatry and seeing patients, do you notice any trends when it comes to 
people's health or people's mental health that just kind of catch your attention. You know, sometimes the research might show this, that, or the other thing, or not. Um, but, you know, the clinical eye notices trends, notices patterns. What, what do you tend to see? Yes. I think most of the clinicians you're speaking to in this summit would, would share my perspective. I was even just talking to a friend about this the other day, that when I started to practice uh, functional medicine, you know, whatever it was, six or so years ago, and I took a left turn from my conventional training, you know, I used to see a patient who maybe had some PMS symptoms and was considering coming off of her Zoloft at some point before our pregnancy. And, you know, it was easy, <laughs> you know, with very simple interventions. It was really uh, quite straightforward. And these days I have, uh, you know, patients coming in who are my age, look fairly well actually, but have come in with 24-hour home health aids because they cannot even function. They cannot hold a job. Nobody knows what's going on. There's a constellation of physical impairments that precludes seeing any given one specialist because it's so broad and encompassing of their physiology. And, you know, these patients have often seen many other functional medicine or alternative medicine providers and haven't necessarily benefited from targeted interventions. So it's a testament, right, to how sick we are becoming and in what complex ways. And that's really what has started to help me orient patients that I work with to my ethos um, because, you know, I've gotten patients well, again, in, in a relatively short period of time, mostly through dietary intervention. And then I've had patients, you know, take an antibiotic, start on a proton pump inhibitor, get a vaccine and, or start on birth control, you know, and not disclose that to me, let's say for a month or two, and then come in symptomatic. And often the undoing of that, particularly in the realm of vaccines and antibiotics, can be extremely complex and, and sometimes, you know, outside of the realm of what's possible, I think. Um, so to begin to think about health more from a, you know, through a lens of radical holism, through, through a lens of um, holding your body to a, a level of integrity that really precludes pharmaceutical interventions is where I get my best outcomes. And I think it's when patients try, you know, they, and it's understandable, right? So they, they try alternative medicine, maybe it helps a little bit, and then there's a crisis, and they end up in the conventional model for dealing with the crisis, and then they try to undo that. You know, so it's this like ping-ponging that I think can make it very challenging for patients to engage a linear progression of, you know, betterment and wellness, but it's, there's no doubt that we are getting, we're getting sicker. Yeah. I, I, I want to say, I love the image of the patients ping ponging back and forth, but, I, but I see that so much. I think it's such a great piece to underline because it's, it's almost like we, like we have this dichotomy set up for us. So you either do the holistic practitioner who doesn't might not give us the kinds of interventions that we need or just doesn't have the whole picture. And then we bop over to the medical model that we've been used to for 40 or 50 years, which can bring us down a black hole sometimes. I'm, I'm wondering, how do you as a clinician, when you're you know, starting to help people kind of graduate from the pharmaceutical model uh, and work in a different way, how is that for you going against the grain, so to speak? Oh, it's fine. It's where I belong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel totally comfortable, only comfortable here. But, you know, I, this obviously will resonate with you. I think a concept that is very operative in my practice, and actually even my engagement with my friends and, and family around their health, because, of course, all of us manage, right, that, or the point people for the health of our, our friends and family for the most part, um, is this concept of fear, right? Because we know that it, it is potentially one of the most determinant factors in, in clinical outcomes. So I really, for, I think I'm just built this way. I don't, I don't know that I cultivated it, although I do work on my spiritual practice, you know, fairly diligently. But I, I, I am somebody who is, is fairly uh, un, unhindered by, um, potential consequences if I feel what I'm doing is true and right. Mm. And so when I work with patients, I think I transfer a bit of that 
um, you know, there's a, probably some effect clinically of that just being around my perspective. But, you know, for example, if I have a patient who wants to come off a of psychiatric medication, and that's a lot of what I do these days in my practice is tapering people off of medications they've been on sometimes for 30 years, um, I won't start the taper until we have worked around an empowerment model where they actually feel they can relinquish it. Because if they are, you know, white knuckling it and they feel like, you know, the moment that last dose is given that, that they're the other shoe's going to drop and what's going to happen? I don't have my safety net and I'm naked out here in the world. And it's just this fear driven process. And it's, it's really a waste of their time, and my time, um, to do it because it's not going to work. And in psychiatry, you know, there is, um, a really, you know, fascinating body of literature that supports the role of expectancy. So it's this word for essentially the placebo effect or the nocebo effect. And, I love this topic because when I was in training, you know, the idea of a placebo was really just this nuisance to sort of get out of the way and how do we control for it. But it's a fascinating um, phenomenon in, in human physiology and why some people have an effect versus another is actually something that's being studied the way we're studying any other epigenetic phenomenon. Uh, but in psychiatry, it's particularly relevant. You know, I talk about a study that came out uh, a couple months ago. And I think it's just such a, a good example of this, where patients were treated on Prozac, right? So they, these are the patients who would tell you, yeah, you know, Prozac totally saved me. I'm doing great. I'm really, really so thankful that it exists, right? And they were told that they were going to be randomized to either placebo, okay, or continued on their dose. This is a crossover. Continued on their same dose that they took on Monday. Now on Friday, they're just going to take it again. Okay, but the mere suggestion that they might be given a placebo resulted in depression symptoms and loss of gains in both groups across the board. So the power of belief in psychiatry has been studied, I think, most thoroughly by a psychologist named Irving Kirsch, uh, who has done really brilliant analyses, two very important ones, one in 1998 and one in 2008 where he really started to look at the power of what he calls the active placebo effect. So essentially, in these trials, when patients are given, uh, you know, let's say Prozac versus a placebo, Prozac has side effects that a placebo obviously doesn't, right? Immediate side effects, headache, gastrointestinal, activating side effects. Um, and as soon as those kick in, it's like all of these decades of direct-to-consumer advertising programming about what this medication is going to do to fix your brain are activated. These are healing pathways, right? Mm. So when you're using an inert placebo as opposed to an active placebo, then you're really, it's called breaking blind. You're no longer engaging the classical model of, a, of an experiment. And, and it's the belief that is powering according to him, the vast majority, if not the totality of the drug's effects. And, and maybe it's particular to psychiatry, but, but maybe not. That's where he's focused. And so we have to really look at the types of beliefs that we're supporting and engendering. And the ones that I obviously feel most strongly are about are, are those that suggest that it's all in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all inside it's, you, you know, the complexity, it's in chiropractic, it's called vitalism, mm -hmm. you know, the complexity and the, the regenerative potential of our physiology in concert with our psychology, with our, with our mindscape is, is limitless. And, and it's just a matter of tapping into it. So we, we, we sort of, the hubris involved in thinking that we've cracked the code, you know, I was a neuroscience major at MIT. And I really loved studying that because it's, the allure of thinking we've figured it out. You know, we've figured the brain out. It's so preposterous. Um, and psychiatry really is one of the greatest offenders, reducing human behavior almost to one chemical, you know, serotonin, maybe norepinephrine and dopamine, um, when the complexity of what goes on on a second-to-second -second basis in the brain not only involves probably 100, at least, neurochemicals, um, but also the immune system, which when I was in college, we didn't even know existed in the brain. So clearly there's a level of unraveling um, complexity that, that's exciting. It should be exciting. It shouldn't be something we resist or sort of feel um, 
you know, even daunted by. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's about your perspective. So talking about perspective here, we are living in a time where it seems that depression is around us. Um, it's, it seems to be there. Um, there's a lot of depressed people. There's a lot of people on antidepressant medications. What is depression to you? Like, and, and forgive me if this is an impossible to answer question, but I would love to hear the impossible. What is depression? And, and, and from your perspective, why do you think it's with us to the degree that it is? That's a great question. Yeah, it's the leading cause of disability in the world. We have about 11% of Americans on psychotropics. We have toddlers, you know, it's cradle to grave medicating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our foster system is particularly implicated. We have one in four women of reproductive ages, of course, you know, my demographic of interest, uh, you know, potentially moving into a pregnancy and all of the largely unexplored epigenetic effects of medication exposure, uh, you know, every day. So it does beg the question, um, you know, do we have more depression? Is it better diagnosed? And I think that it's, it's both and, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that we do have more depressed people in the world. Why? Because depression is this largely meaningless wastebasket term, in my opinion, for all of the malaise that is the accumulated toxicant burden of our daily life. Right. So when we look at concepts like mitochondrial dysfunction, we look at concepts like dysbiosis, we look at nutrient deficiency, we look at endocrine disruption, the inevitable clinical outcome of those exposures in a vulnerable person are going to include the symptoms of depression, mood changes, sleep changes, energy changes, uh, changes to, you know, sexual appetite, changes to metabolism. And these are, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's epidemic proportions of, of people who are dealing with this sort of like layer of dysfunction that they've almost, it's become a new normal. And then of course there are the people who are more disabled and more severely impacted and they're often caught in sort of like, you know, the, the chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, sometimes Lyme disease, NETs. Uh, but they always have psychiatrists involved, right? So their psychiatry has become sort of the last stop for a lot of patients who, for whom conventional medicine is ill-equipped to help, you know, because, for example, you know, your conventional doctor runs a thyroid panel and your TSH is 4.1 within normal limits. That's all they've checked. They're not interested in whether or not there's any autoimmunity or whether free hormones are optimized. And, and so you're going to be told, you know, your, your thyroid's fine, you're fine. I see nothing here and you probably should see a psychiatrist. So in that way, the limitations of conventional diagnostics, which of course are totally antiquated at this point, uh, really set patients up for psychiatric visits. Um, but so does our lifestyle, right? But then there is the other, I guess, darker underbelly of how we are potentially promoting epidemics in two ways. One is because of diagnostic criteria ballooning. You know, we just had the mm -hmm. um, DSM-5 uh, come onto the scene. And, and, you know, if you look at how the DSM has ballooned from the 1950s, this isn't evidence-based medicine. It's essentially a dictionary of terms that, uh, you know, a bunch of white men sit around a table, most of whom have pharmaceutical ties, and they come up with terminology. And maybe some of them have good intentions, and they want to help patients, and they want to you know, encompass more people, bring them into treatment. But I certainly don't have that rosy perspective on it. And I, and I do have concerns that what we are, in fact, doing is creating a, a broader pharmaceutical market uh, without any objective testing to preclude prescription. You know, you go to a psychiatrist's office and what do they do? They chat with you sometimes for 15 minutes and you get a prescription. There's no blood work. There's no spec scans. There's no EEG. You know, there's there's nothing. There's not even an awareness that that should be uh, a gatekeeping diagnostic procedure just so that we're not medicating people inappropriately or dangerously. So there's not even like a fear of liability because it's built into gold standard practice now to medicate before you even think. Um, 
And then there's, as I mentioned, you know, Robert Whitaker's work, which really asks the question that you're posing, which is, we have escalating rates of disability from depression. Uh, we also have escalating treatment, right? As I mentioned, shouldn't those be inversely correlated? Shouldn't treatment yield less disability? Isn't that actually the point of it, mm -hmm. right? And so he explores a lot of the long-term data, uh, most of which is not industry funded, and essentially comes to the conclusion, which of course is very provocative, but it uh, makes sense to me, that it's actually the medication treatment itself that is promoting disability. That we are turning something that might have been a single episode of depression in like the 1960s, spontaneously resolving within 12 weeks, certainly within a year, that we're turning that into a lifelong condition that essentially disables patients chronically. Yeah. So where they, you know, where their quality of life is um, is implicated, where their where their work potential is diminished, et cetera, and then a lot of subjective parameters. And you know, we have now I think better understanding of how and why antidepressants, for example. But he really leaves no stone unturned. You know, he. He looks at stimulants, benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, all of them, um, why these medications force the body to adapt in a way that is wholly unnatural. And in a small segment of people, it may actually be an adaptive effect called by Joanna Moncrief and other psychiatrists called a drug-based effect um, in the same way that alcohol might help with some anxiety. That's a drug-based effect, right? So in some people, antidepressants may, uh, and the adaptive effects that the body engages, may actually be helpful for them. But in the majority of patients, their body adapts over time. They lose whatever potential transient benefit if they ever had one. And now they're in a state of a dependent relationship with a chemical that is sometimes impossible to come off of. Um, that's frightening. You know, when I used to prescribe... I never sat a patient down and said, okay, this is what we're going to do for now, but there's a possibility if we don't reevaluate this in three months that you could never, ever get off this medication until you die. I never said that to anyone, <laughs> right? Woo. And now I see it, you know, and now I see it in, in the flesh that this is a real, it's a real issue. These medications have been around now for, you know, the better part of several decades. And, and so we see the long-term effects and I absolutely think Whitaker uh, is onto something. So it seems like we've become so accustomed. It's almost as if pharmaceuticals and antidepressants, it's kind of like, you know, candy. It's like we give it out and it's motherhood. It's there. You just do this. We don't question it. Right. And the fact that we're giving it to our youth, we're giving it to our toddlers, we're giving it to our parents pets for goodness sake yes, yes. I boggles mama and and it's and it just feels like all part uh, to me sometimes it just feels like all part of just sort of the larger kind of psychiatric picture that we face which just feels like there's a sense of fear and disempowerment as soon as there's a glitch in the system like oh I'm not feeling good I'm feeling depressed do something there's almost like a panic button it feels that happens when I have any symptom. Yes. And it's because we have been divorced from any sense of traditional wisdom, particularly here in America, but we're really co-opting that in other countries as well mm -hmm. with our capitalistic influence, you know, and, and, and any sort of appreciation of spiritual growth, right? I mean, when's the last time you went through a really dark time or had a tough time? I bet that you came out of it shifted, right? That you came out of it evolved and that you took something from it that you don't want to give back. You know, you took something from it that you value. And today, you know, we are raising children and we have my, certainly my generation is really um, living under the illusion that distress is pathological. It's something to be suppressed. But it's not just that. We feel that way about fevers, aches and pains. We, we've lost this sense that it's actually a message from our body that something is off. Our body is highly skilled at recalibration, right? Homeostasis is a powerful force. And when that is not possible, it's because there is a burden so large 
that the body is not able to respond without support. And so this concept that there's a free lunch, that we can just suppress a symptom, you know, I've referred to it as like a whack-a-mole phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, it doesn't work. It just absolutely doesn't work that way. Um, and so it's, it's the fear, it's again that fear that I believe the industry in partnership with media has really grabbed onto because they, you know, we worry. It's part of survival instinct. Um, but rather than worrying about resolvable conflicts or, you know, sort of allocating our fear, you know, appropriately to external stressors, we, we worry that we don't have it in here to fix ourselves. We don't have the intuition, we don't have the wisdom, and we don't have the resources. Um, and so I, I think a lot of it is sort of like a crisis of that wisdom, feeling disconnected from the natural world and the fact that, you know, we can't just bomb germs into non-existence. I mean, have, not, have we not learned that that doesn't work? I mean, everybody, you know, across the country knows that antibiotic resistance is an issue, right? I think most that's even entered the lay consciousness. We know that there's no way we're going to beat mother nature. It sounds so cliche, but it's totally true. It's, it's a ridiculous and preposterous notion. So, so I really try to educate patients about, um, relocating that fear and, and really fe fearing pharmaceutical interventions for appropriate reasons for documented adverse effects, you know, things like Tylenol, you know, that is an over the counter medication is astounding to me, um, b because of its lethality, let alone its potential for chronic uh, adverse effects. And, and this is something that we should be afraid of. Um, not a, a fever, for example, which is a, a, a native reflex aimed at recalibration, right? That's what it's for. It's not just an annoying thing that your body is doing <laughs> to get in your way. You know, it's like, so we've like just totally lost patience, I think really, right? Like it's patience for ourselves. And I'm an incredibly impatient person. I've been working on this for many years. <laughs> um, so I get it. I totally understand um, wanting results quickly, wanting results yesterday. Uh, but if you don't work with your, your natural physiology and you don't embrace, you know, distress that is appropriate to circumstance, then I think you're really going to end up with an unfulfilling life when you look back, you know? Yeah. It's a risk. Well, you know, you, to me, you brought up what I think is a fascinating topic, which in a way is our relationship with time these days. Yes. Uh, because, you know, oftentimes this too shall pass when it comes to the fever, when it comes to the symptom. And it, it, it seems like, yeah, there's this rush to like get it over with so I could get back to whatever this thing is that I'm doing, which is I'm working, I'm being busy, I'm important, and all these things have to happen. And we are busy, and we do have important things to do, and yet time is so precious, it feels like, and we want to make sure we speed up out of whatever seems to be stopping us. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and again... I can relate to that, but there is in the cultivation of mindfulness, right? This idea of watching oneself um, with a dispassionate eye, there is in that an ability to identify things that aren't serving you and to, and to really start to look at what it is that you want, what it is that you want out of this experience in life, right? Like we all know sort of death of a salesman style, we all know that, you know, the drudgery of our, you know, hyper stimulated existences, for the most part, is not where we derive fulfillment, right? So people are living for their vacations, they're living for this, uh, you know, I'll be happy when mm -hmm. type of a thing. And, you know, one of the most powerful books I've read in my, I love reading books, that's not obvious, and they influence me a lot, but was, uh, is a book called Untethered Soul by um, Michael Singer. And it's short and sweet, and it's really sort of like straight to the point, um, whereas I've read a, a ton of mindfulness texts, and some of them are prescriptive, and they tell you what to do in four weeks and whatever. This is sort of no instructions. When you're ready to live this way, read this book mm. and just do it and just do it. And the idea is that you have a choice. You always, always have a choice to engage in the mentation to engage in sort of like the cluttered 
mess of uh, you know, our minds and to, t- to take the bait, right? To take the bait that if only you do this, if only after that, you know, oh, if I just fix this, it's so um, urgent and, and compelling to try and, you know, focus to the point of uh, acute anxiety on resolving our, our problems, but mm. it never makes us happy. Think about it. I mean, think about how many problems we've resolved and, and so many of us are still searching. And personally, I, you know, I'm a bit of a nihilist myself. So personally, happiness is not something I think is like the Holy Grail. Um, but I do think that a sense of ease and freedom and purpose are very important qualities for a human uh, existence. And so when I'm working with patients, I'm not really looking for them to come in and say, God, I just feel so happy every day. <laughs> I don't think that's ever happened. Uh, but I am looking for them to come in and say, you know what? I feel ready for whatever's coming mm. and, and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with whatever's coming. It's a sense of resilience that I think you cannot cultivate when you are in a dependent position relative to a paternalistic medical model and a pharmaceutical intervention. So it really has to, you have to be in charge. You know, you have to be in this position of agency. What do you see? How do, how do people get there? Is it just, okay, they show up in your office and I'm ready and that's who comes to you. Um, do you have to educate them? What do you see as the process by which people sort of arrive at this doorstep? That's a great question um, and one that I continue to refine because I obviously have synergy with some patients from the moment we meet and then there are patients who I really have to drag down the path <laughs> and that's challenging, you know. Uh, and, and I do think there is an element of readiness that sometimes I'll meet a patient for a consultation and I'll say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you your roadmap. I have a sense you're not ready yet. But when you're ready, it's here. You know, my door is open if it's in six months, if it's in two years. And I've had that happen. I've had patients come back to me after years, you know, two, three years and say, okay, I'm ready, ready to roll now. Mm-hmm. Um, because I really have, um, and, 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 and I know that this doesn't work for, for everyone, but I have a very uncompromising uh, approach where there's essentially, you know, like dietarily, for example, um, I hold a fairly rigid bar and you, you probably could poke a lot of holes in that approach from a, a psychological perspective. But I do think that once you show patients that they are capable of adhering to a protocol that they otherwise would have felt they had no room for, like we can expand to encompass a lot of stuff, right? Mm. So you show them they're capable of doing it and then the results are self-evident that that becomes its own turbine engine, you know, that becomes its own motivating force. And I really can start to let go a bit because they've already demonstrated to themselves that it was all in front of them, you know, and then there's, you know, frankly, minor help that I can offer in terms of um, nutrient support and, and supplementation and then, you know, resources for, you know, little crises that do come up. Um, but I, I really do think that it's part of engaging a, a, a strict initial protocol that, that yields very high results. And then the patients can sort of, um, it's a process of self-education and connecting dots. I mean, I think that's really all I offer people some of the time is, is making sense out of this like mess of um, dots in their life and, and, and trying to help them understand that this causes that. And so if, if, if I remove this or restrict this, then I don't suffer that. And if I choose not to, then I might suffer that. But at least I know why, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's so, so basic and simple. But many of us need external accountability for that. I think that's natural. You know, a lot of us need trainers at the gym, nutritionists, you know, to, to, to keep us on the straight and narrow or, or, or physicians to sort of help frame the entire process. Yeah. And by the way, just so you know, I wouldn't call your approach rigid when you set a high bar. To me, it's more like it's thoughtful, it's clear, and it's targeted. Because as you just said, sometimes that is what we need. You know, sometimes what we need is a little more vacation time and a little more spaciousness and a little more rule breaking. And a lot of us, wow, do we need some very clear guidelines to move through. Right. Because how many times have we, you know, sort of 
half engaged a diet or tried half a bottle of supplements or, you know, went to a doctor once and then followed up eight months later. And not only is that sort of like a waste of time and money, but it also sends this sort of unempowering message that your efforts in the natural world are low yield. And I resent that, you know, Mm -hmm. as as a meta issue because it's absolutely not the case. I mean, the yield that I get and that my colleagues get in, in natural medicine blows conventional outcomes out of the water. Mm-hmm. In, 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 I, you know, I have radical cures in my practice, and, I, and I'll call it that because that's the patient's perception you know, on a weekly basis. And when I was prescribing, it never happened one time, not one time. And, you know, and, and I... Um, have developed sort of like a mentorship relationship with Nick Gonzalez, who's a holistic doctor here in in New York. And I think he's one of the most shining examples. I mean, his outcomes using just targeted nutrients and, you know, detoxification support and his particular approach to to healing, he has outcomes that have never been evidenced in the clinical literature in, in the cancer realm, period end of discussion. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think that's profound. I mean, how could you ever say that natural medicine is a window dressing treatment? You know, the way Memorial Sloan Kettering and all these integrative hospitals here in the city treat it like, yeah, here's, you're here for your chemo and radiation, but, and, and if you want, you can go do a little yoga and maybe, you know, <laughs> take some ginger root. Like when you, when you really put it as the, the, the thrust of your treatment, I mean, the, the potential for outcomes is just, it's profound. It's in, inspiring. So, it's a, yeah, it's a bit about framing that perspective, I think. And it, and it shows us what's possible. I, I, it, it seems, and, and this is where, you know, people like you, myself, once you understand this, and I, I was just blown away, by the way, when you said, you know, when I was just doing pharma and giving people prescription drugs, I didn't have cures. Um, yeah. You know, I didn't have these supposed, you know, miracle changes happening and wow does that say something about what happens when a practitioner transforms her or his practice and steps into a brave new world the possibility is wild yes absolutely absolutely and and, and particularly if it's if it's a partnership that is predicated on a mutual uh, respect for the potential of the work, mm-hmm. right? Like those are when the best outcomes happen. And, and it's, I do believe because it has to do with the fact that the, you know, when you, when you meet a patient with the right energy, you can help them to shed fear. They don't want, you know, they don't want to live their life feeling like they have to run to the doctor every second and they can't live without pharmaceutical meds. And they're just putting out all these little fires all the time. People don't want to live that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so they want, I, I think like a shepherd <laughs> and, and, you know, and it, you should never f- fake the funk. I mean, if it's not your natural orientation, it would make no sense to practice that way. But certainly, you know, if, if you feel passionately about it, sometimes patients, I think just people just need to feel uh, like they have partners in the journey. Mm-hmm. I don't know, it could be that simple. So Kelly, where do you see the future of healing going when it comes to mental health, when it comes to, you know, who we are as physical beings, as emotional beings, or or I can say, what would you like to see as we Mm. move into the future? You know, I think they sort of dovetail because rather than being sort of pessimistic and end of days oriented around where things are going in terms of the medical industrial complex and associated legislation um, seeking to rob us of our civil liberties around health, um, I do think that on a consumer level, on a patient level, there is a growing dissatisfaction and a growing awareness of the limitations of a model that is so antiquated, medical schools should be shut down today, apart from emergency rotations, let's say. Um, And I think that, that I can't, frankly, I can't even imagine being a conventional doctor in practice, how you meet patients with their myriad complex needs. I mean, it must be a horrible experience. And we know that doctor burnout is a very uh, real phenomenon. There are a lot of efforts to expose um, corruption and lack of checks and balances at the level of uh, the government and its association with various medical authorities and pharmaceutical industry. 
So I do think that there is an awareness that that something is up, right? Mm. And, you know, so there is uh, my sort of, uh, it's like the Bucky Fuller quote, you know, it's this idea of creating something else, uh, not working within the paradigm, but creating something entirely different and, and making sure that it is so appealing that you don't even have to really advertise it, you know, uh, it speaks for itself. And, and that's really what I, I think all of us are doing, you know, fighting within the paradigm while I am interested in doing it and interested in the associated activism, um, it's going to be a very slow road. And a much quicker path is to just start to live well, right, and mm -hmm. feel well. And then people will ask, you know, what are you up to? You know, I have, I have two children who are never sick, never taken antibiotics, never had an ear infection, you know, and I've had people ask me, like, what do you do? What, what do you feed them? What? You've never been to an emergency room? You know, these sorts of questions. So some of it is, is just a matter of um, truth and advertising and, and, and the medium can be the message. So I do see that. And it's, and it's really a lot about social media, unfortunately. You know, all of those EMFs we're absorbing every day off of our devices. So it's, it's a matter of um, the transfer of information happening at the speed of light in ways that it never, never could have occurred at times of, uh, you know, needed revolution in the past. So I like to remain optimistic that, um, that we're all interested in learning more about what we don't know about health and the human condition and re remaining open uh, to learning. I mean, the, the articles that abstracts that I read on PubMed every week are so exciting and mind blowing. There's a lot of very smart people out there doing very cool things to elucidate our relationship, the mic, you know, about the microbiome, for example, or um, the, our relationship to plants and the information they, that we uh, receive from them on an epigenetic level. It's just really cool science out there. So I think there's enough of us trying to put a megaphone to those you know, brilliant researchers that we're allowed to bring it into the homes of you know, the Ohio soccer mom. And I think that's really exciting. So that'll be my part. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I so appreciate your perspective and your approach and your voice. And I know that, you know, on one level, um, stepping outside the system a little bit and seeing things from a different perspective comes natural for you. But mm -hmm. um, at the same time, looking from the outside, uh, it's a fabulous talent and a fabulous quality. So really thank you for all your amazing work. How can viewers and listeners learn more about you, what you're up to? How do we stay in touch? Awesome. I appreciate that, Mark, coming from you especially. So, um, yeah, I have, a, I have a website. It's just my name, kellybroganmd.com. I have a newsletter uh, where I try to, again, digest these pearls, make them clinically applicable, and, you know, I call them snippets. So it's just tiny blogs. I also write long, boring ones as well. Um, but I try to keep people updated because there is a ton of information to digest, and I know very well that it's hard to do that. So, so yeah, that would be where to find me. I am on Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it as well. Yay. Thank you once again for being a leader in new psychiatry, new medicine, uh, much kudos to you and, and really appreciate the conversation, Kelly. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much.